All right. Well, welcome to this discussion here today. I'm Wade Crowfoot, and I serve as our Natural Resources Secretary. And we've got a great discussion uh, queued up uh, uh, for today. Uh, as you know, uh, the title of our discussion here is Building Trust Between State and Tribal Governments. What does true co-management mean? Uh, most of today, we'll be learning from uh, tribal leaders and representatives um, just what does true co-management mean between tribal governments and state governments uh, on all things natural resources? Uh, I'll start by providing a little bit of context, uh, then we'll turn it over to the governor's tribal advisor, Christina Snyder, uh, and then we'll hear from three leaders uh, who are uh, working hard uh, to make uh, co-management uh, happen uh, between uh, tribes and, and the government, and that is Bill Tripp, the Director of Natural Resources and Environmental Policy for the Karuk Tribe, Shauna McCovey, Director of Natural Resources and Governmental Affairs for the Resangini Rancheria, and Sam Cohen, Government Affairs and Legal Officer, the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians. So I'm really uh, excited by the discussion here today or with the discussion here today. Earlier this week, uh, the governor held uh, his second annual Tribal Nation Summit to bring together leader, for leaders from uh, federally recognized tribes here in California and state government uh, to talk about deepening partnerships uh, on uh, really all manner of subjects. Um, I think many of you know that last year, uh, the governor uh, met a major milestone when he issued to tribal leaders a formal apology on behalf of the state of California uh, for uh, a state policy uh, initially of, of genocide and ultimately discrimination of uh, native uh, inhabitants of California. And he talked a lot about it being an important moment to issue the apology, but much more was needed to actually uh, usher in a new future. And so our agencies have taken uh, his direction very seriously. And at our natural resources agency, one area we're focused on is how can we learn uh, from tribal communities and tribal practices uh, to manage our natural resources? After all, tribal communities uh, have been conserving California's nature since time immemorial. And uh, we think that there is a lot to learn. We also think there is great potential to institutionalize uh, work between governments uh, to co-manage natural resources. And so today we're gonna to unpack that and, and learn a little bit more from tribal leaders and representatives around what that means and how, do, how does the state uh, or local or federal government actually approach those uh, co-partnerships with tribal governments in ways that respect the sovereignty of those governments and the traditional knowledge and practices that those tribes have maintained uh, for a very long time. To start off our conversation, I would like to introduce Christina Snyder, who again is the governor's uh, tribal advisor. And Christina is gonna provide a little bit of a high level context uh, around the work between state government and, and tribal governments as uh, we begin our discussion here today. Thank you, Secretary. I will just jump right in. Greetings everyone. And it's my pleasure to join you for today's Secretary Speaker Series. My name is Christina Snyder. and I'm a member of the Dry Creek Rancheria Band of Pomo Indians and the tribal advisor for Governor Gavin Newsom. I'd first like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the original homelands of the Patwin peoples. And I also, again, wanna thank this team for bringing us all together while so many of our community members are struggling with the impacts of COVID-19 and wildfire. Um, I'm excited to share with you some of the important initiatives Governor Newsom has forwarded in his time in office and the lens through which we view native peoples in this space. So during his time in office, Governor Newsom has demonstrated a developed understanding of the complex issues facing California Native Americans and a willingness to do better. The governor's approach in doing this work is grounded in the history of this state and its treatment of California Native Americans since its inception. The lens through which the Newsom administration views all of our work is that Californians are best served when our systems, laws, and policies reflect the diversity and richness of all cultures in California. And we have to approach this work through a lens that fully and honestly accounts for everything these diverse populations have experienced up to this point, or else the state risks making the same mistakes in more insidious ways. So in working from this viewpoint, the state is in a better position to address current and ongoing systemic problems in engaging and integrating California Native Americans and their valuable contributions by taking a critical and honest look at the historical root for these issues and the state's role in that history. As many of you are aware, uh, the state has a long history of ignoring, disregarding, or excluding California Native experiences from its work across issue areas. 
Part of this likely has to do with acknowledging the truth of the California experiment, that there were rich and diverse Native populations up and down the lands that now make up the state of California, and that they didn't just disappear when, when Americans discovered gold. Instead, these populations were in the way of new Californian wealth, either because they were physically located in resource-rich areas, or they shepherded and managed lands in a way that stood in the way of environmentally destructive resource extraction practices that we're still dealing with today. At the time, the privileged few uh, decimated California Native peoples and their relationships with these places, that served as orchards, nurseries, parks, homes, shopping centers, and places of worship since time immemorial. And to accomplish this, early Californians removed native people from their ancestral lands, sometimes physical relocation, sometimes worse, um, and legislated native people out of their role in managing these lands and set out to reimagine environmentalism based on tried and true practices brought from Europe and the East Coast. The consequences of the shift in narrative and the imp importation of rules and practices in an environment where they're largely irrelevant and were developed while actively suppressing the insights and experiences of the people in the best position to know this land and its quirks are being starkly felt throughout the state today. The state's now in a position to work to address these long-term injustices, make space for native people and reorient how we think about our collective environment. In June of last year, as Secretary mentioned, the governor issued an executive order apologizing on behalf of the state of California to California Native Americans for the state's role in that, the genocide of those peoples. And in addition to apologizing, the executive order established a Truth and Healing Council, which can look at, um, can works in consultation to shape the overarching focus and develop the work of the council, and will endeavor to accurately represent the diversity of experience of California Native Americans within the state of California. A particular relevance to this conversation, it's possible that the council could examine the systemic and intentional destruction of native ancestral lands and resources as part of its work. And the council has been authorized to examine and make recommendations aimed at reparations. Um, the Native American Heritage Commission, where I also serve as executive secretary and which sits within the resources agency, also just released a mapping tool that brings to life the rich diversity, histories, and cultures of California Native peoples in the places they have called home since time immemorial, and includes overlays of Native trade relationships and routes, as well as the resources traded, something that can be helpful to the conversations about traditional resource use, including seasonality and regionality of resources that predate European occupation of these lands. I'd also like to br briefly touch on the recent policy issued by the governor on Native American ancestral lands, which tears from the governor's executive order because it really is the anchor for all of the work moving forward to revive and reintegrate Native Americans, their experiences and knowledges into their ancestral spaces and seeks to amplify the work the state has already been able to do up to this point in working in partnership with California tribes. In September, Governor Newsom issued the Statement of Administration Policy on Native American Ancestral Lands to encourage state entities to seek opportunities to support California tribes co-management of and access to natural lands that are within a California tribe's ancestral land and under the ownership or control of the state of California. And to work cooperatively with California tribes that are interested in acquiring natural lands in excess of state needs. The policy was issued on the heels of the State Land Commission's conveyance of 40 acres of state-owned land within the ancestral lands of the Lone Pine Paiute Shoshone Tribe and the California Natural Resources Agency's award of Prop 68 funds to the Esalen Tribe of Monterey County for the acquisition of about 1,200 acres of their ancestral lands earlier this year. In addition to supporting those type of initiatives, the purpose of the policy is to partner with California tribes to facilitate tribal access, use, and co-management of state-owned or controlled natural lands, and to work cooperatively with California tribes that are interested in acquiring natural lands in excess of state needs in order to, among th other things, facilitate the access of California Native Americans to sacred sites and cultural resources, improve the ability of California Native Americans to engage in traditional and sustenance gathering, hunting, and fishing, and partner with California tribes on land management and stewardship utilizing traditional ecological knowledges. Part of the reason for adopting the policy was that the governor sought to support state initiatives that allow for tribal access, co-management, or ownership of ancestral lands with the laws each state agency is subject to and the respective authorities make it effectively impossible to create an across the board approach. Prior to issuing the policy, several state agencies, most of which are under the resources umbrella, already engaged in this collaborative work, and the governor wanted to affirmatively encourage more of that work as aligned with his executive order. There's, uh, 
in practice, the policy has already been integrated into the Newsom administration's recent executive order on biodiversity, conservation, and climate action, which requires the administration to engage with California tribes as critical partners and integrate traditional ecological knowledges and tribal expertise in biodiversity, conservation, and climate action efforts. In all of this work, it's been personally such a rewarding experience for me to work with a governor and a resources secretary who have the openness, willingness, and courage to take on these issues head on and really elevate the priorities of California Native peoples. So again, I'd like to thank the secretary and the resources team for all of their great work and I'll stay on for the rest of this conversation. Yowie. Thank you so much, Christina, and thanks for your leadership. I mean. It's remarkable around what's happened in the last couple of years um, under Governor Newsom, and that is a direct result of, of your partnership with him on all of this. So many thanks uh, to you for your leadership and that superb explanation of exactly uh, what's underway here in the Newsom administration. So before we kick it off uh, with in discussion with our, our three leaders here today, we have a special treat, which is about a nine minute video that will in a very compelling way uh, uh, bring home uh, what we're talking about here today. And that is a, uh, a video uh, developed by the Tuala Dene Nation uh, on the North Coast, uh, explaining really how they are advancing their traditional practices in forming new partnerships with the state uh, in co-managing uh, that resource. So we're gonna, we're gonna watch this uh, nine minute video and then uh, initiate our interactive discussion with our three panelists here today. So I just kind of take the medium, the semi-large ones. I don't know, they're a little bit smaller than my hand. Well, if we're gonna eat dinner tomorrow, how many think we need? They uh, shoot, uh, shoot a test, Dama. Shoot, shoot, he just shot he shot one. You know, you don't want to take the real small babies and you don't want to take real big ones. But in this area right here, there's not a whole lot of big ones. So this ain't a too bad of a spot to harvest from. Uh, he was your baby. And then, then as for the testing part, you know, if you get these smaller ones, you can use those too. What do you guys think? I think that's probably good, huh? The way I was taught, you know, you can harvest mussels year round as long as you get them underneath a shady spot. That's why I was grabbing them underneath. So in that process, what we'll do is, is just take a sample and then we can make sure that they're safe for our tribal citizens to harvest. Okay, so you see these here? These bristles, lot, that's what connects the, to the rock. So you don't ever want to try to open it from this side. We get about 10 or 12 to fill up a specimen jar. We hand pull them off the rocks and then we shuck them down at the beach. I freeze them overnight and then they get shipped to Department of Public Health. They'll blend them and then determine how much PSP and DA is in those samples. And what you're doing is you're cutting this muscle right here. That's what holds that together. And then you want to cut this off like that. Okay, so you can try it with this one. PSP is paralytic shellfish poisoning and DA is domoic acid. When we see high levels of, of PSP and DA, that means that there has been a plankton bloom offshore, which is when cold, nutrient-rich water comes up into the water column. That provides a lot of food for the plankton, which in turn will start reproducing at a very, very high rate. The biomass of these plankton are toxic. When mussels and razor clams feed on plankton, they're gonna bioaccumulate those toxins in their tissue, which in turn makes them dangerous for humans and animals to eat. It's been kind of a blessing and a curse to know the levels of the toxin, but for some reason now, the levels are higher. And you know, our ocean is changing. Our 
environment has changed. If we don't protect these resources somehow, some way, they won't be here anymore. Ten years ago or so is when the Marine Life Protection Act process began. All up and down the North Coast, there were a variety of different projects that hit on all different habitats that are going to be included in MPAs. An MPA, or a Marine Protected Area, is an area that is uh, designated by the state to have certain restrictions, certain take of a particular species, or no take at all in an effort to conserve the area and provide a safe haven for species to go away from fishing pressures. When the state decided to put these MPAs in our area, the tribe stood up and says, we're gonna continue our traditional practices of harvesting these resources. It was pretty clear in the law that there wasn't really acknowledgement of tribal rights or um, tribal customary or subsistence uses within the marine protected areas. So there was a need to sort of make that case to the state that tribes, you know, retain these unceded rights to continue to use the ocean. We were successful in getting tribal take recognized in the state process. So it's been, you know, a, a small victory in at least creating a space within the state framework to recognize um, tribal harvesting. So then that rolled into then the MPA baseline monitoring program. I came on board to conduct the MPA baseline monitoring projects, which were a collaboration between tribes and academic institutions to establish a baseline of data of species that are present, population abundance, and that sort of thing. What about in there? That's too rocky. We can try that. So besides our biotoxin monitoring for mussels, razor clams, and plankton, we also do our smelt habitat assessments. So this is a GPS unit. So what we're gonna do is um, we'll walk the perimeter of this gravel bed. And this gravel bed here is what we would consider uh, smelt habitat. And then I'll go over here and uh, take a GPS point of where she's taking temperature. Okay, my temperature is stabilized on my first one, so we got 55.5. You push it down. So this would be really nice gravel for them to spawn in. This is very, very suitable habitat right now. And their eggs have this really like super, super adhesive coating on them, so they'll stick to the gravel. When we're done, we try to leave it as undisturbed as possible for the smell. Foot traffic won't crush those eggs, but vehicle traffic the vehicle will. will. Yeah, we try to stay on the same road that we made on the way down, and then that way there's not a whole bunch of tracks all over the beach. Looks like we're out here playing. We're actually working. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, should we try to go get some more mussels then? Wait for that to go out and maybe go up over yeah. that rock right there. There you go. So it's important to have a tribal perspective when coming into these projects because Indigenous people of the North Coast have been here since time immemorial. They've seen the changes, they know what's there. To have their perspective and their traditional knowledge in these projects is a key piece to understanding the current resources and the current uses of these resources. When you're harvesting from the sea, you want to make sure that you're harvesting for sustenance. And you never take the largest of any species. You always leave it because they create the largest offspring, the best offspring, the strongest offspring. So you usually harvest the middle age things from the ocean. And you are very cautious of the young ones, the mashkaya of all the animals and sea life because they need to continue to grow. We have a verb for muscling, for example. The gag means to move around. 
You don't scuff them off the rock and take all generations. You pry them and rock them loose. So it's a verb specifically for gathering mussels. You're just taught to always respect the food because, well, it's our sustenance. It's a way of life and you have a relationship with them that's very important. They're just so packed in here. It is packed. Like the rock is probably at least a foot below all of these mussels. Since tribes are such place-based people, I mean, having that like generations and generations and generations of observation in a particular place really can tell you a much richer um, understanding of what's going on. You know, all the other studies are looking at today. Where are the populations of these species today and how are they gonna change in the future? But is today really abundant and healthy? No, it's really not. I think that's where I would like to see a lot more focus is how do you sort of support tribes building their own capacity, gathering this knowledge for their own purpose, and then using that sort of in parallel with co-management with the state. You have the traditional side on how to take care of resources, and then you have the actual numbers or data that we collect, and it shows that change. So it all works together. In a sense, in Western science, it's just backing up what we've been taught forever. Well, thanks to the producers of that video. That's actually about a nine minute clip in a 30 minute program that you can uh, find on, on the internet. And one key takeaway for me is just the importance, the need uh, for state uh, and federal scientific institutions to partner with tribes because tribes bring uh, knowledge and practice that we simply don't have. And co-management is about respecting that and acknowledging that and finding ways to work together uh, on an equal, uh, respectful footing to, to manage the resource. So we're gonna shift into our discussion with our panelists and we're gonna first hear from Bill Tripp, uh, who I said uh, helps manage natural resources with the Karuk tribe uh, in uh, far Northern California. Bill, I'm gonna turn it to you. And if you would just, first of all, give us a little context uh, for the, the resources that the Karuk uh, Nation is managing. And then some of your initial perspective uh, on, on co-management. Before you talk though, let me just uh, let people know that if you're tuning in and watching here, you have an ability to ask questions or share uh, comments or observations. Uh, on the bottom of your screen, you will see a button that says Q&A and you can type in your question there. And, and as uh, after we uh, hear initially from each of the three speakers, we'll get involved in an interactive dialogue and uh, integrate uh, those, those questions from folks viewing here today. So let me turn it to you, Bill. Thanks. Um, yeah, I wanna start by saying that uh, what a pleasure it is to be invited into a conversation like this. So it's been a, been a really long time coming. Um, we've, um, we at the Karuk tribe have been uh, working to, um, you know, fix the wrongs done to all of our brothers and sisters out there in the natural world um, for, for quite some time. And, um, and, and uh, we, we operate um, at scales that um, a lot of folks don't understand when it comes to our sovereign uh, relationship uh, with our territory and our resource base. Um, you know, we, we um, a lot of people speak to things like lands um, and they assume that means a trust land or a fee parcel, um, but our constitution actually defines that as our entire uh, Aboriginal territory, um, including any kind of lands um, that, that are, have been acquired in one, one way, shape or form. And so, um, you know, that jurisdiction that comes with our, our ability to, to enact um, you know, tribal law um, and and uh, do things under our sovereign authority, um, you know, is is defined at that scale in our governance systems. And a, a lot of times that isn't recognized uh, by by folks that we're working with. Um, that is starting to change. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work with the state and with the federal government um, and uh, in the co-management arena or shared stewardship arena, uh, it comes in a lot of different names. Um, the, the one thing that um, really uh, comes under the, the, the name of co-management uh, clearly uh, by definition um, is, is in some of the relationships that are being built in the California Department of, of Fish and Wildlife or uh, I, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you got it. And, and um, 
And so, you know, there's a really uh, solid effort there uh, to, to actually, um, you know, use the terms co-management and, and things like the management of a uh, large game like elk and, and things like that, that are critical uh, food source for the third people. Um, and so, you know, there, there are some barriers so along those lines, you know, with everything, especially when relationships are, are just starting, uh, but we can get into those a, a little later in the discussion. Uh, but we're doing a lot of work in, in fire as well. We've been taught um, that, that we learned from the animals originally, um, and those foundational principles have been passed on to us since the memorial. And um, if there is a piece that's missing, we know that we can look to the animals again and relearn that. And so that's a critical part in this relationship. Um, you know, we work a lot with, um, we're starting to work a lot more with CAL FIRE and, um, and other, other agencies in, in bringing fire back uh, to the people and, and the land um, and uh, in the benefit of, of all these resources. Um, you know, of course there are challenges, challenges there. Um, you know, we have a large landscape collaborative um, discussions going on um, in a lot of a lot of areas. Um, you know, working with the Western Klamath Restoration Partnership, the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network, the Trex Coaches Network, and and just just so many different um, just different arenas, and um, and uh, including the UC system, which I've just learned is actually part of state governance in itself. I did not realize that previously. Um, so so yeah, I think with that, this is probably probably the four minutes uh, to start start the <laughs> overview. Absolutely, Bill. And I want to unpack uh, some of those uh, efforts that you're engaged in on the large game management and, and prescribed fire. But let's turn to Shauna McCovey, uh, who again is uh, our, the Director of Natural Resources and Governmental Affairs with the Resagini Rancheria, uh, also on the North Coast. Um, Shauna, if you would just give us uh, some um, broad idea of uh, both the challenges and opportunities uh, you face on natural resources management and the role that uh, co-management may play in your efforts. Shauna, you need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. I apologize. I was muted. Um, thank you, uh, Secretary Crowfoot. I just I want to start off by saying thank you very much for having this conversation. Um, it's a, it's like Bill mentioned, it's a long time coming, um, but I don't think that people realize how important it is. Um, and just anecdotally, when um, some of the tribes up on the North Coast started working uh, in the Marine Life, Pro Marine Life Protection Act initiative in 2009, the state said to us, um, we have no mechanism to consult with you. Now, we know we've moved beyond that now. We've got mechanisms for consultation with the state. Um, and now, you know, 11 years later, we're in this place when we were on the precipice of co-management. So I just want to thank you for having this discussion and thank the governor and his office for uttering the words co-management and putting them in writing, um, it's, it's really, it's so important and, and something that we've been working on for many, many years. Um, I wanted to share briefly with you a bit about the Tribal Marine Stewards Network because I think it's a really important project um, and it's a partnership uh, between the state and a number of tribes up here on the North Coast. So the Tribal Marine, Tribal Marine Stewards Network is a pilot project uh, composed of four partner tribes, the Talawa Dami Nation, Resigini Rancheria, who I happen to work for, the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians, and the Amamutsun Tribal Band. Uh, we have two NGO partners who are supporting us in this effort, mm -hmm. along with the Ocean, Prote Ocean Protection Council, OPC, and um, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So this is really uh, an important project that um, as you saw in the video previously, it is, is a, a state tribal effort to ensure that tribal people, our, our and indigenous traditional knowledge is being used in the management of California's natural resources. Um, we're at the pilot project stage, so we're just beginning. Um, but some of the goals are to identify shared priorities um, and build tribal capacity, 
of these, not only these four tribal bands, but we hope to, you know, to broaden the, um, our outreach and bring in some tribes from Southern California uh, as we do this. Um, the, the tribes are gonna be conducting research and doing monitoring, um, engage, engaging in wider tribal community to bring, to bring actual tribal members into this work, um, collecting data and indigenous traditional knowledge, and then creating a plan to, um, to scale up this network, as I mentioned. Um, but I think this is a really good example and a good start, a good starting point when we start, when we begin to talk about co-management. Because I don't think that we really are really there at the level that tribes would like to be in the state. And, um, and we've got some work to do. And, but right now we've got the state's ear. And so it, it's very important to, to um, highlight these projects and the efforts that, that are uh, happening. Um, so we've just initiated this project. Um, we're, we are starting to build the network. Um, we, you know, we need to figure out a couple of things, uh, governance structure, et cetera. But, it, but it's really, really exciting. And it's, it's also, it ties into California's um, MPA monitoring and some of the work that's, that's being done uh, by the state related to the, the MPA's uh, marine protected areas on the coast. Um, so, so we're hopeful. Um, we're hopeful with this project. We're hopeful that um, that there are going to be continued opportunities um, to not only talk about this, but to to figure out a plan forward. Because you know, I don't I don't know that we can or we want to wait another eleven years before we actually have you know co management agreements with the state. You know, tribes have always managed the lands like you heard in the video. Um, and it, and it, it's, it's time to have, you know, it's time to recognize that um, at the state level. And I'll talk about it a little bit more because I wanna talk about how do, we, how do we institutionalize this and how do we make this um, something that um, is part of uh, the resources agency, um, you know, that, that, this, uh, that we're building these relation, relationships and we're building this trust and how do we now institutionalize that at the state level? Absolutely, and I want to I want to talk more about that. Uh, but before we do, uh, let's hear from Sam Cohen uh, again, leader and representative of the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians. Uh, Sam, uh, you are located in Southern California, so a different set of um, of opportunities and challenges down there. And if you would just give a little context um, for your for your tribal government's perspective on the potential to, to uh, co-manage or, or partner with state government on natural resources. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, my name is Sam Cohen. I'm the government affairs and legal officer for the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians. It's always good to have a lawyer on the panel because it makes <laughs> everyone look better. You know, that's my theory. <laughs> so I'd like to talk about co-management and my theme is co-management is never easy and may be more complicated in Southern California. From point conception to the Mexico border, tribes have been forced inland and away from their coastal Aboriginal territories. For example, the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians are half an hour inland from the city of Santa Barbara and near the Danish village of Solvang. You don't think of us as ocean going, but the Chumash trace their lineage to the Channel Islands and the coast of Santa Barbara. So in 2007, when the Marine Life Protection Act restarted and cent the Central Coast Marine Protected Area was proposed, the Chumash asked for tribal consultation and were totally refused. So the Chumash started to going to Fish and Game Commission meetings and speaking in public comment every month. We became Fish and Game Commission groupies, right? But it was not until the North Coast Marine Protected Area did tribal voices finally get heard and we are in debt to the Northern California tribes. The Northern tribes disrupted meetings and ultimately got cultural and subsistence fishing exemptions in the MPAs. So when they restarted the South Coast MPA from Point Conception to Mexico, the Southern California tribes proposed co-management, which was promptly rejected. So Sumas started going back to the Fish and Game Commission meetings. And finally in 2012, Chumash were given a process to get cultural and ceremonial fishing exemptions. These regulations took quite a while to get into effect and finally went into effect in 2019. 
You know, but we are so enthused that in 2020, the Northern tribes again are leading the MPA area with the Tribal Marine Stewards Network. So we'd like to conclude with how we would just want to point out that co-management is evolving. You know, statewide tribal consultation really was not codified until 2011 in Executive Order B-10-11. I'm going lawyer on you here. Sorry. <laughs> In 2012, uh, the Natural Resources Agency adopted its tribal consultation policy. It was a little bit cookie cutter, but it was timely. In 2014, the Department of Fish and Wildlife adopted a tribal communication and consultation policy, but it actually had its guiding principles to encourage collaborative and cooperative relationships with tribes and matters affecting fish, wildlife, and plants. In 2015, the Fish and Game Commission itself issued their tribal consultation policy about collaboration. In areas of subjects of mutual interest, the Fish and Game Commission will pursue partnerships with tribes to collaborate on solutions tailored to each tribe's unique needs and capacities. And I, I know you're not a Fish and Game Commission groupie like I am, but if you were, you'd know there's a tribal subcommittee of the Fish and Game Commission. And just this year, they are adopting a co-management vision statement and definition. So we have come a long way. And then finally, I, I hope you were able to attend the governor's second annual Tribal Nations Conference. And there was so much good information and I'm, we're indebted to the governor for all of his progressive policies. But I have to mention that Christina Snyder, who is on this call, she stood up at that meeting and requested that each tribe apply for co-management opportunities. I think that was historic. It's a historic opportunity for every tribe, you know, to make a request. Don't, don't be embarrassed. Don't think of it as outlandish. You know, this is, this is your moment. And going forward, Secretary Crowfoot, we're looking for your help. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And I want to turn to Christina for a moment, if I could, just because uh, we're joined by about 700 people uh, in our discussion here today. And many may not know the, 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 the term consultation and what it means uh, for a state government and why it's so important to tribal governments. So Christina, could you just give us a little one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one around what governmental consultation means uh, on these topics? Sure, and I will also do my best to not speak in legalese on this. Um, <laughs> but we have in Indian country, um, because before I came here, I was actually a tribal attorney. And in Indian country, we have little C consultation, which is you know frequent communications, open lines of communications. And then you have big C consultation, which is the consultation that I think most tribes think of when they think of a government to government engagement. And that would be you know a leader um, decision maker to a leader decision maker. And so, um, you know, when we talk about Executive Order B-1011, um, which Governor Brown issued, um, and Executive Order N-1519, which Governor Newsom issued, which incorporates by reference, which means it brings that whole executive order under its umbrella, the consultation um, piece of, e of B-1011, um, we say that the state is committed to um, upholding this commitment to engage on a government to government basis with California tribal leaders who are the elected officials of their political entities. Um, why this is unique for the state and why this is like an amazing thing for the state to do is because the state doesn't technically have any like case law or any regulations saying that they have to do this. Um, the federal government by um, contrast has a trust responsibility. They've got um, constitutional responsibilities. They've got case law. They've got regulations. They've got treaties. They've got all of this body saying that they have to just, they have to have that government to government relationship with tribes for anything that relates to tribes. They don't always uphold those trust responsibilities, but it's still law. For the state to proactively adopt that in a place where they've actively kind of worked against even the existence of native peoples is um, a major progressive policy movement um, for both the previous administration and then carried on um, to even co-management here, which has never been done before. Um, so I hope that wasn't too all over the place, but that's kind of a, a quick and dirty on consultation. Christina, that's very helpful. And in my education on these issues, it's really important to distinguish uh, you know, tribal leaders uh, as, as a government to government relationship. I think sometimes the trap that agencies, state agencies have fallen into in the past is 
uh, treating tribal communities as, as stakeholders, um, uh, similar to um, an environmental conservation group. And while I have great respect for those types of groups and actually spent part of my career working there, um, these relationships are different and they truly are government to government among um, uh, sovereign uh, entities. And so that's, I think, really important to, uh, to understand uh, if you are somebody watching here today and you wanna encourage um, this type of partnership and co-management. I'll tell you another thing I learned that I'd ask any of uh, the panelists here to reflect on uh, in this couple of years in this job is this, this acknowledgement and understanding that uh, people and nature go together. I think sometimes in the modern environmental movement, we've thought about protecting nature from people and nature is, some, is somewhere where people are not. And what tribal communities have taught us is actually people and nature go together and tribal communities have been stewarding our environment again uh, for thousands of years. And so uh, panelists, anybody wanna just share uh, sort of how, how your communities view your role in, uh, in stewarding uh, the natural resources environment and what it can teach us in state government? And I, any can, of you, I can, yeah, share, thanks, I can share a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think, so as a, so I'm a Yurok person and as a Yurok person, we are taught from the very beginning that we have a responsibility to take care of what takes care of us. And so, um, and so that, that has been instilled in us. That has, that's been a practice over time. Um, and in order to do that, you know, we have to, we have to do certain things. And Bill will be able to talk more about you know, the traditional kook building, or sorry, burning, um, um, and you know the other tribes and on the North Coast region did the same thing. Um, so, so we've always been we've always been actively managing these lands. These we are just as we are as much a part of the lands as the lands are, uh, you know, a part of us. So that you know that concept we're taking care of what takes care of us. It just it's. You know, it, it's not something. It's it's in, inherent, um, like our sovereignty, like like our traditional ways, um, all of that. So, so yeah, we we've always done this. But what I what I like to share with people um, every chance I get is that we have a responsibility to do this. So we need to be able to do this. We need to do. We need to. There needs to be a a space created. So that we can do the work that we're supposed to do. Mm. Thank you. I know one of the tricky questions uh, or just issues with co-management is how traditional knowledge and practices are treated within co-management and um, avoiding the appropriation of traditional knowledge or practices uh, from, from tribes. Uh, and so, you know, the respectful uh, co-equal partnerships involve um, being able to uh, utilize uh, traditional practices within those partnerships, but, but not essentially take the knowledge in ways um, that are disrespectful to the tribal communities. Can any of you talk about sort of the, the, the role that a good co-management um, agreement would, uh, how a good co-management agreement would, would treat um, the use of, of tribal knowledge and practices? You know, we, we actually have an example of that um, that we've developed through our uh, Kudok UC Berkeley uh, Collaborative. Um, and it was kind of tailored off of some of the work that the Maori have done um, and, um, and uh, around some of the intellectual property rights um, issues there. Um, and so we, we actually established a, a policy uh, when it comes to uh, research collaborations and uh, made it to where we could could you know make it more expansive and broad to other situations if if the situation presented itself uh, but but it, it outlines um, you know some some principles uh, behind how how we uh, would interact and and uh, establishes a protocol with agreement um, particularly with research there's a lot of mistrust um, there, um, as well as, you know, relationships with, with others, uh, sometimes. And, and so, 
you know, things like putting shared copyrights on things and, um, and uh, providing protections to where we know that, you know, we're not just going to come and say, well, this is what we believe and this is what should happen. And then have someone else come in and say, okay, this is ours now and we're going to do it for you. Um, there, there are a lot of people that worry about that. And, and so, so um, you know, building in uh, provisions that assure that that's not going to happen um, is, is really important. That's really helpful, Bill. While you have the, the floor, would you talk about some of the conversations you've had with the Department of Fish and Wildlife as uh, around uh, co-management of big game uh, like elk up, uh, up in uh, Northern California? Yeah, we've, um, you know, we, we haven't got to the point of establishing a co-management agreement uh, just yet, uh, but we've built it into our bigger picture uh, Western Climate Restoration Partnership activities in that elk is one of the focal species and why we're managing fire at the landscape level. And so we're integrating all of these things that really lead into um, partnerships potent potential with multiple aspects of, of the um, uh, state and federal and NGO sector um, and just even private individuals. And, and, um, and we, we ended up getting to this kind of odd place in that, you know, even though the intent was there and we submitted for a grant proposal and we got funded to do some collaborative research for, for uh, trying to get some elk DNA uh, data and trying to get some true population assessments and try to show the benefits of landscape scale fire management had on landscape holding capacity and winter range um, habitat um, restoration. And, and um, you know, we've gone through the first couple of years, got some good examples and, um, you know, we hit, hit a few, few roadblocks there. Um, you know, the big one being a, a recent notice that said that, well, Actually, we've got to dig in into our authority for how we can spend money from the big game enhancement grants, and we can't even give it to tribes. We have to give it to them and NGOs. <laughs> mm. So, so uh, we're forced into a situation where we have to rethink our entire relationship. So um, we're, we're working through that now. Yeah, and you, you know, you and I have worked a little bit together uh, on on thinking through how do we expand the the forest management and prescribed fire practices. And that does seem like it's, it's a potential barrier on co-management is, you know, if the state has resources as a very, very large government, um, you know, how it can get resources uh, to sovereign tribes uh, to manage and co-manage resources and how it does that in a way that doesn't um, uh, make vulnerable the sovereignty of those tribes, right? Uh, and so to your point, Bill, you know, I think that, you know, in my workings with tribes, they've been very clear that, you know, that essentially, you know, contractual relationships are not simply a grantor grantee relationship uh, and that we need to figure out frameworks and utilize frameworks that exist to really allow for resource transfer in ways, again, that respect the government to government relationship. Um, there's a question that was coming in around um, the potential for more transfer of lands uh, from the state, uh, parcels that uh, might not be utilized as, as once envisioned, um, whether it's Caltrans or uh, electric utilities, uh, or as Christina mentioned, the State Lands Commission, uh, and, and you know, how we're going to uh, explore get doing more of that. Um, I'll just say that uh, Christina mentioned that the governor issued uh, an order to our agencies to essentially identify what lands uh, could be uh, transferred that are in the ancestral homelands of, of tribes in California and then advance efforts to do that. Um, there's an active effort under uh, an entity that's called the California Stewardship Council that was founded out of the first PG&E bankruptcy uh, to transfer um, uh, parcels that that utility doesn't need anymore. Uh, and there's some interesting conversations around uh, being able to transfer uh, ownership of parcels uh, back to California tribes. Um, I just turn over to maybe Sam for your thoughts around, you know, you're a lawyer, as you mentioned, what are some barriers or what are some sort of pitfalls um, that we should avoid? You'll have a lot of people on this uh, in this discussion who are, are from uh, governmental agencies and interested in this co-management 
what what are um, what are lessons learned and things we should avoid as we yeah, consider uh, co-management uh, with with tribal governments? Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. I, I just wanted to give you an example. Um, one of our uh, friends, one of our tribal friends, is the Machupta tribe near uh, Chico, Cal State Chico, and uh, they were having trouble. They wanted to get a piece of land that was considered surplus transferred from Chico State to the Machupta tribe. And it turns out that in reviewing the Fish and Game Code, um, the Fish and Game Code allows the, the Wildlife Conservation Board to transfer land and make grants to nonprofits, the local governments, the federal government, but does not include tribes, either federally recognized tribes or California Native American tribes. So not only do we need to uh, amend Fish and Game Code 1350 little c to help the Wildlife Conservation Board uh, make these important transfers to allow tribal co-management in tribally owned space. I, I would like to volunteer to review the entire Fish and Game Code with uh, anyone, <laughs> maybe Nathan, uh, Nathan Vogley. I like it, Nathan. Uh, and uh, we, we just need to clean up a bunch of uh, these code sections. And it'd be so tempting just to say local governments includes tribal you never know what kind of unintended side effects you'll have when you do something that sweeping. So we really need to review the code and make sure that tribes are represented so that we can have a to allow tribal co-management activities. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, as it relates to state law, you know, law sits on top of law, sits on top of law. So as Christina mentioned, you know, when we look at uh, our, our legacy of state government and the lack of respect uh, for tribes and interests in these partnerships, it's no surprise that some of the, this, this legal language that at this point is over a century old uh, doesn't uh, make way for these types of partnerships and co-management. So Sam, I, I love your idea. Uh, I've seen the size of the Fish and Game Code, so that's quite a, uh, quite a volunteer effort that you're signing up for. But uh, your point is well taken, which is identifying, you know, where we need to update uh, California law to enable these partnerships. And I know the governor would be uh, excited uh, uh, for that project. And I know legislative leaders, or I imagine legislative leaders um, would as well. Uh, Sean or Bill, what, what other sort of points of caution would you make uh, as we lean forward following the governor's direction to try to establish more, more co-management? Well, I'm I don't know if it's necessarily caution, but I, I did want to sort of piggyback on what was being said about the, the funding piece, because I think that this is a really important part of actual true co-management. So tribes are often, tribes have to piece together their resources departments. You got federal funding, you've got state funding sometimes, and then you've got private foundation dollars. And tribes are also having to compete for those same pots of funding. So one, I think one of the barriers to true co-management is this lack of dedicated funding um, and, and a mechanism to be able to pass that funding along to tribes. And you mentioned that and, and Bill mentioned that as well. We've got to figure out a way to do that, um, to, to create some sort of um, institutionalized dedicated pot of funding, uh, whether it's in, in the resources agency or somewhere you know, housed within the state. Um, because the, the, the funding that tribes get from the federal government is minimal. It's insufficient to run natural resource programs. And so the other piece too, the for example, Tribal Marine Stewards Network, it's, this, is, this, is a, a great, this is a great project, um, it's, but it's a two-year project. It's, it's granted, it's a grant from the Ocean Protection Council. We had to use a, uh, an NGO to, to um, pass the funds through. So that, and that creates time and um, or, or a delay in actually implementing the project. So if we could figure out a way to create this mechanism to pass this funding, it would be, it would be really, it would be incredible to try. Shauna, thank you. And that was actually one of the questions that came in from uh, uh, somebody who's viewing this discussion, which is, is there dedicated funding for these, these partnerships or this co-management? And uh, the answer is, I don't believe so now. Uh, our agency, I think uh, has last year, uh, provided about $20 million in resources for different projects with tribes, but 
it was on this, uh, in some cases, competitive, but certainly not um, designated. And so to Sean, or to your point, uh, creating designated funding streams for co-management so that, you know, tribal governments and your, your employees don't have to essentially, you know, uh, chase or compete for, for resources and can focus on the partnerships, I think is a, is a really good suggestion. Another question came in uh, about whether there's a consistent definition uh, across state government regarding uh, natural resource co-management. Uh, and to that, I don't believe that there is. Uh, Sam raised that uh, the uh, Fish and Game Commission for the first time is uh, defining for itself uh, co-management. So when it does that, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can uh, consider applying that across our natural resources agency. But I think as our panelists have said, the, you know, the state interest in this is fairly new. And it seems like we're at the beginning of really institutionalizing um, these partnerships. Um, other question that came in, and maybe for you, Christina, is um, uh, somebody who works with uh, Parks in Sonoma, I wanted to better understand how to identify uh, tribal communities and tribal governments in their areas uh, to potentially reach out and explore partnerships. Can you talk a little bit more about that, that mapping or what sort of resources uh, we have at the state um, to uh, identify uh, tribal governments across our state? Sure. So there's lots of resources and a lot of them we don't create, but we um, borrow from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, who is, you know, kind of the federal agency um, who has oversight over Indian Affairs in the United States. Um, but you're asking the right person because my tribe happens to be in Sonoma County. Um, but there's actually a, a list of tribes by county, which is a good place to start. And I can send that link to our, our tech person if he wants to put it in the chat, if that's even a possibility. But it'll break down um, which tribes are in the county. And then once you start from there, you can actually look up each tribe at this BIA tribal leader um, directory. Um, and at that directory, it'll give you the exact contact information for the tribe and you can actually reach out that way. Um, we at, within the state have contacts for all of the tribes as well. So if that's an easier way to go uh, without, okay, great, I can post these links. So I'll send these links after I'm done talking. Um, if it's an easier route for you to, to go that way, we actually have a state tribal directory too that is online and available. Um, we also have it in print with a nice pomo basket on the front. Um, and uh, we can provide that as well. But really, um, there's so many resources out there. You could even probably Google Sonoma and Mendocino tribes, and you'll see who's in that area. Um, and that's how you could probably start those engagement opportunities. There's also a number of nonprofit organizations in the areas that can help connect you as well if, if you need kind of a, um, a connection that way. That's great. And, and while we're on the subject of providing links, um, there were some comments in the Q&A uh, for those that would, would like a link to the video presentation that we uh, showed at the top of the discussion. Also, we will have a recording of this discussion, which we will put on our resources website under the Secretary Speaker Series. Um, so this is something that you or others can, can watch uh, later on. Um, let's turn it back to the panelists. Uh, other, you know, uh, we talked some about or asked you some about, you know, potential pitfalls or things to avoid, but what, I mean, what do you, if you would talk a little bit more about the promise of, of co-management, what can effective co-management look like if, if we get it right uh, for, for state and tribal governments and, and why is it a priority for your tribes? And maybe I'll pick on Sam first, cause I see him and then uh, go, to, go to Sean and then Bill. All right. Well, first of all, I promised the uh, Tribal Subcommittee of the Fish and Game Commission that I would plug their Monday meeting at uh, on the 16th at 1.30 when they're going to talk about co-management definitions and visions. So please zoom in on Monday to the Fish and Game Commission Tribal Subcommittee for additional co-management work. And I, I, I guess I think of co-management as part of a global trust building exercise. You know, um, we uh, in the San Inez Valley, where the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians exist, have had a long-term, almost contentious relationship with the County of Santa Barbara and, our, and some of our neighbors. And you know, over the years, the tribe has worked very hard to build trust on a variety of levels. And uh, co-management is just another of those levels where the tribe 
needs to work with their neighbors and uh, to kind of demystify what the tribe is doing and uh, normalize relations and even cooperate if that's possible. Uh, you know, in the regulation of natural resources. So we we work we try very hard to uh, to be uh, to be as uh, open and transparent as possible. Yeah, and the importance of just building trust. That's of course you know moment creates momentum for for more work together. Totally. Yeah. Good. Shauna, thoughts? What can successful co-management uh, co partnerships mean? And, and what does it mean to the Rancheria and uh, Yurok and, and other tribes? Yeah, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to echo what, you, what you're all saying, because it's so important it is. It's that trust building. And it's that con continued relationship uh, between the tribes and, and the state. Um, but it's also what I mentioned before. It's creating a space to allow tribal people to be tribal people. Um, and because that's, that's really what we want. You know, we, we want to be the managers and the stewards of our environment because we always have been. And, you know, we've been, we've been pushed into, onto rancherias and onto reservations. And, you know, having the state think beyond those, like, reservation rancheria borders um, and, and acknowledge that um, tribes are, have ancestral territories that they've always been in. Um, I think that that is really important um, in terms of successful co-management. Um, but yeah, just this continued relationship building, dedicated funding, um, help uh, building tribal capacity because you know we we need more tribal capacity building. Um, there are a lot of tribes that you know have just a few staff, so but but want to be able to be engaged in this type of work. Um, yeah, that's great. Bill, thoughts. What does success look like from your perspective and from the Karuk perspective? We may have, yeah, Bill, Bill was actually dropped. I think we're having some, some uh, poor technology karma uh, here today. I'm at our resources uh, agency headquarters and we ourselves have uh, some the tech issues. So I'm actually doing this from my phone today. So Bill's gonna uh, come back on. There was a question uh, from uh, a participant about um, how to navigate uh, partnerships that may involve multiple tribes uh, because uh, you're working on a resource or a part of the land that uh, may be, cl be, be claimed uh, by multiple tribes. Christina, um, thoughts on, on, on how to navigate that and maybe it's through the consultation process? Yeah, sure. I think that Shauna may actually have a better perspective on this, um, working for Resigini and being a member of Iraq, but I won't put you on the spot for that. Um, but I think part of this is the history of California tribes is that there's a lot of big tribal groups that have a lot of overlapping ancestral territories. And a lot of us had, you know, summer houses on the beach and, and winter houses inland and acorn houses. And we had, we kind of moved all around like people in California do now. Um, and so uh, I would say consultation, like you just mentioned is key. Um, but ultimately um, the state never wants to be in a position of, of telling people where they belong or who is the, the right native person for anything. And so ideally um, you will be able to reach agreements that all parties are happy with. And I think an example of that is at Fort Ross, honestly, um, under the state parks department has worked with both um, Great and Rancheria and the Kashaya to have kind of collaborative um, um, messaging and, and be able to represent both the Coast to Miwok but then the Kashaya presence there. Um, but that's not going to be um, across the board. And sometimes there are actually some sticky relationships that that it's honestly really difficult to navigate. Um, and so we hate to, to do this, but it is it, first, I think, having the one on one consultation with each of the tribes to understand what those challenges are and figuring out whether there could be a potential solution. But then also, um, you know, it really isn't our place to tell people to get along either. And so like there may be projects that we may just have to put on hold until we can find a path forward, um, which doesn't mean we don't wanna do it, but it is much easier when people agree on at least like a direction where everybody's not unhappy. And yeah. feel free tribal panelists to disagree with me. 
No, I, I totally agree with you. And I would say that even, you know, put it back on the tribes because, you know, we have a responsibility to work through our own issues. You know, if we're, a, you know, a number of your groups up here, uh, we need to come together and get on the same page, especially if we want, if we all have the same interests, you know, we, and we really do. And so it's important for us to be able to work those, those things through. Yeah, fair point. Christina, another question for you um, resulting from the Q&A from participants. Um, you know, uh, wh how, how do we work with tribal communities that aren't federally recognized uh, that, uh, and if you would, because we have some folks probably new to this conversation, can you explain um, the difference between tribal communities that are recognized by the federal government and what it means as it relates to uh, legal rights and, and how that does or doesn't impact how we work with tribal communities in California? You're really putting me on the spot here, Secretary. <laughs> um, but really in terms of cultural resources and natural resources and protection of sacred sites, um, we don't really distinguish between non-federally recognized tribes and federally recognized tribes, um, except in so far as those resources are on in the jurisdiction of a federally recognized tribe, because that's you know, they have regulatory authorities and they have jurisdiction over those areas and we're not going to tell them what to do on their lands. Um, and so I would say for purposes, well, okay, let me back up. So in California, there's all of this history of genocide, termination. For those of you that don't know what termination is, the federal government has the, um, basically, let me back up even further. So there are a bunch of tribes here before uh, the United States. Surprise, surprise, shocker. And so what happened was when um, the European came here, they entered into a treaty relationship with some of the tribes that were here. And that was kind of the basis for um, nation to nation engagement, much like it is on the international scale, because at that time, it was international relations. Um, Fast forward to the United States, the United States inherited a lot of those treaties and those relations. And so the nation to nation relationship persisted. Um, and over time, uh, the United States has interpreted that to be a little bit more skewed in favor of the United States. Um, also, surprise, surprise. Um, but also, um, when it did that, and as it evolved over time, it decided that it didn't so much like having to have all of this responsibility over the people that were still on the land that, you know, that they had taken basically, um, even though that was part of the, the deal there was that um, part of it was, you know, provide education in perpetuity, provide health services in perpetuity, provide certain lands um, in perpetuity. In perpetuity apparently means something different to the United States. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm infusing this with a lot of opinion. Uh, <laughs> but so um, in California, and, and, and you'll see this too, as you go west, what the United States decides they're going to do with the tribes that they encounter becomes less and less um, nation to nation and more and more of kind of not wanting to deal with it anymore. So once they got to California, um, Alaska has kind of a bad, a bad situation because they're even further. Um, but California is a situation where um, the United States was like, we don't want to deal with this. The state was like, we'll deal with it. And the way that the state dealt with it is what you saw in the apology. And so um, California tribes, a lot of them were, you know, completely obliterated. A lot of them were driven to places like Round Valley, to Hoopa, to um, uh, Tule River, to these reservations that were established um, and then disestablished or not established. And, um, and so the history here is basically wanting to get rid of all the tribes. And then when all the tribes didn't get, didn't go away, everybody decided that they had to do something about all of the homeless native people that were still here. So a lot of the tribes that are formed here um, are from, you know, groups of homeless families that banded together just to survive. So a lot of the ranchery, as you see, that's groups of families that banded together to survive. Um, some of those people weren't captured when, not captured, sorry, that's a bad term, but they weren't included in that recognition process of, okay, you're, you're now a tribe uh, that we'll have relations with and we'll have, um, you'll get benefits for, of being a tribe. So there's tribes that never were recognized. And sorry, that was a long intro, but they were never recognized. You have, um, there was a period in the 50s where, um, or maybe it was the 30s. Well, there was a period uh, a little while back where all of the tribes basically were terminated because the federal government was just sick of providing resources. Um, and then um, as uh, tribes 
realized that they weren't getting what the the government promised in in um, in doing that termination because they promised lands, they promised roads, they promised all this other stuff, infrastructure. When they realized that they were getting the raw end of the deal, we're like, look, we're we're still native, we're still here, and you're not upholding your promises. And so a lot of tribes then got re-recognized. So you have this whole patchwork here of recognition, which doesn't mean that non-federally recognized tribes are not native people or are not tribes. Uh, it doesn't mean that federally recognized tribes are more native people or more tribes. It's just this crazy legal like patchwork puzzle um, that means that um, you know who the federal government treats with and has a resource and government to government relationship is different from who California views as the ancestral um, inheritors of certain spaces, cultural resources, and sacred sites. So that so we have a list at the Native American Heritage Commission of all of those California Native tribes that we believe are tied to, um, based on certain criteria, are tied to certain lands and resources and sacred spaces. Um, and part of that is that you know there's places like LA, San Francisco, S Sacramento, where there's so many weird interests right now that recognition is highly unlikely. Um, and that's not my assessment. That's just kind of people keep trying and, and there's so many interests that are fighting against it that it's really hard. Um, so what we do at the Native American Heritage Commission is we're more interested in natural resources, cultural resources, sacred sites, sacred spaces, ancestral lands. And so that is not, recognition is irrelevant when you're talking about that. It's basically like, are you descended from the people who are from here or are you not? Mm -hmm. So that was very long-winded. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a no, really complicated it's, I mean, look, area. I think it's really helpful because obviously we have folks on the phone uh, from a tribal or state governments that know a lot about this and then others that are learning. And I think, you know, part of the challenge of this issue is there's not a lot of visibility uh, on, on the needs and priorities of tribes in, uh, in certain mainstream, you know, culture. And so, Christina, you taking the time to give us some of the history of that and the the way that that has resulted in different levels of recognition, but also the point that, you know, we're working with tribal communities regardless of their federally recognized status. I think that's really, really important. Um, time flies on a topic like this and we're to the end of our discussion. I wanna give our three panelists any opportunity to say uh, any final words uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, close us, uh, I'll close it out here. Uh, Sam. Yes, sir. I would say gambate kudasai, which is Japanese for please persevere. All right. Uh, this is a very difficult process, and uh, we've all been working on it for over 10 years. And I, 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 I don't, I want to be optimistic and say I see the light at the end of the tunnel, and maybe we will. And, uh, but it's up to us to create what co management is going to be. Thanks so much. Bill or Shauna. Yeah, I, I uh, sorry, I got dropped off for a little bit. I got unstable connections. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, th I think that there's some solid next steps here in in um, in in moving forward towards towards an, an era of, of co-management and shared stewardship. And 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 um, you know, I think part of that is really really doing some of the things that Sam uh, Cohen uh, mentioned about digging into the the law, the policy, the regulation, and, you know, seeing what is, um, you know, a, a, you know, something that's founded solid in law and maybe might need to need a longer discussion or, or if it's, you know, if it's maybe an interpretation of law that can maybe be handled at an administrative level uh, within individual agencies. Um, and, and um, you know, with, with an eye towards really looking, looking for ways to overcome the barriers we face. You know, we, we have, strengths um, among our, our sovereigns. We have strengths among our strengths among our partners that we can bring to the table as well. You know, right now with the, the uh, Western Crown Restoration Partnership, we, um, you know, we don't ask for CAL FIRE burn permits because we don't want to diminish our, uh, diminish our sovereignty, but we have a relationship with an NGO that will ask for those permits until we can build that relationship. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are, you, you know, Workarounds that you can use as you're building that, that trust and, and and making things happen, and so you know I think it's those kind of things um, and, and steady progress in the discussion um, that that builds the the systems for co-management 
uh, that truly respects tribal sovereignty. Thanks so much, Bill. Shauna. Yeah, so um, we need to continue to obviously have these conversations. I think that's uh, an important um, next step. Um, it would be nice to see something happen, and, and I don't know what that thing is, but to see an action, you know, what, whatever that might be in the relative future so that we know that this co-management is, is something that, um, that we can, that we are going to be able to see come to fruition. Um, but the last piece that I, and I just want to close with is, um, you know, you're, you don't have to figure this out alone. You've got, you've got us here, uh, panelists on the phone and plenty of people in tribal communities who are working on this type of, uh, of this type of stuff. So, you know, we need to figure out what co-management is together. So, and, and I, I thank you again for, for having this panel and uh, reaching out to us. Well, thank you. And the last question uh, that we received is um, just an acknowledgement that while Governor Newsom supports this and is prioritizing it, there's no uh, necessary guarantee that future governors would. And so if I had a crystal ball, what would this look like in 25 years? And I'll, I'll say, I mean, as you've heard from our leaders, um, we're, we're just at the beginning of this process and we in state government are learning a lot around what it takes to create uh, co-management. So I would see, you know, in the next, uh, you know, couple, you know, two to five years, uh, really getting uh, some good co-management uh, efforts, uh, you know, taking flight um, that really are demonstrating promise. And then as that's happening, finding ways to institutionalize this, whether it's in state law, whether it's improving regulations, whether it's creating the mechanisms to really make this easy uh, or at least uh, doable. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I really think that when we identify the models that work, we are going to move to institutionalize those models. And this will be a question of not if in the future, it's just how and how much. Um, let me end with a, a really beautiful comment that came in on the Q&A um, and paraphrasing it. Um, it's essentially, um, let's keep on making the invisible visible, the unnamed named, and center our efforts around indigenous leadership. Um, so with that said, I thank uh, you panelists. Uh, huge thanks, Christina, for all of your leadership. And thanks to everybody uh, for tuning in, whether you're from state government uh, or uh, any part uh, outside of state government. Really appreciate the discussion here today. And once again, you can find uh, a copy or a video copy of this uh, discussion on our natural resources website. Uh, have a great weekend.